So David has a long and distinguished track record in uh, studying glucose sensing and insulin delivery in the context of an artificial pancreas, not only from the technology standpoint, but also from the medical perspective. And he's going to share some of uh, his knowledge and insight with us today. So David, thank you very much for visiting with us. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Athanasios. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, you guys probably know, but uh, I'm just going to tell you, Georgia Tech is one of the top bioengineering programs in the country, and it's just getting better all the time. I, I hear so much about the great work here in the news and in the science journals, so uh, it's, it's really a, a great pleasure and an honor to be here with your group. Uh, I, I'm editor of Journal of Diabetes Science and Technology. I'm an endocrinologist, and uh, my interest is in engineered solutions to diabetes. I, my hospital is called Mills Peninsula Health Services. This is the Mills campus where my office is in San Mateo. Our other campus in Burlingame, the Peninsula Medical Center, is just opening and it's going to be the most earthquake-proof hospital in the nation. <laughs> we have to worry about that. Uh, now, this slide tells you what things are like where I come from. It's the California budget crisis. Due to budget cutbacks and restrictions, we have to do stem cell research with flower stems. Now, today I'm going to be talking about diabetes, and uh, the artificial pancreas is an interesting solution to a diabetes problem. So I'm going to define diabetes uh, so we're talking about the same thing. Diabetes is a disease where the body is not able to use glucose adequately, and the glucose accumulates in the blood. And uh, there's type 1 diabetes, which means no insulin at all is being produced, or type 2 diabetes, which means there's not enough insulin being produced, and insulin is produced in the pancreas by the islet cells. Uh, I'm going to show a slide about why diabetes is such a serious problem in the U.S. before I talk about what we can do about it. Eight percent of Americans, which means 26 million patients, and another 79 million patients with prediabetes. That's over 100 people in this, 100 million people in this country have diabetes or prediabetes. Almost everybody has a friend or relative with diabetes in this country. Uh, it's the leading cause of blindness, kidney failure, and amputations. People with diabetes have a three times higher incidence of heart attack and stroke compared to people who don't have diabetes, and the health care costs are close to $200 billion per year. So diabetes is pretty bad, and uh, we're looking for new treatments. Uh, this article came out this month in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine by a group at CDC. And they're talking about a, a geographic phenomenon known as the diabetes belt. Uh, these counties, the darker red they are, the more diabetes. And uh, uh, what they then did is they, they, they sort of isolated out the counties with a lot of diabetes, which are in pink. And uh, you'll notice that right here, we're in the diabetes belt. So you should be interested in diabetes living here in Georgia. We're interested everywhere else, too. Now, this is what patients want when they have diabetes. They'd like to have a normal blood sugar level automatically and not have to worry about it, not have to do self-monitoring of blood glucose, which means pricking the finger to get a drop of blood and test themselves. They don't want to have to worry about how much insulin do I use, have to calculate something based on their blood sugar or what they're going to eat. And really, they don't, they don't want any injections of insulin. So if we can come up with a treatment to uh, eliminate these problems and provide normal blood sugar automatically, then that would be a nice kind of a cure for diabetes. And there's two kinds of cures you could come up with. You could use a biological solution or an engineered solution. Here at Georgia Tech, in the green on the left side, we're seeing a lot of work in the biological solution, which means to provide replacement islet cells. Now, you can do that through islet cell transplant or whole pancreas transplant, or you could do encapsulated islet cell uh, implants or tissue engineered slash genetic engineered cells that you've converted into producing insulin. Those are all biological solutions, and, and they, they're difficult problems. There's the engineered solution, which is an uh, area that I'm interested in, which is to create an artificial pancreas out of non-living material. You would have in that system a continuous glucose sensor, an insulin delivery system, and insulin dosing algorithm software. So these are two directions to achieve a cure for diabetes. 
my feeling is for what I do that the engineered solution is, is what I'm interested in. I think that the uh, biological solution ultimately is a better solution, but it's more difficult. So I would say an engineered solution is a practical goal until a biological cure is developed, perhaps here at Georgia Tech. Now, since I'm talking about an artificial pancreas, I'm going to define it. This is a device containing only synthetic materials which substitutes for an endocrine pancreas by sensing the blood glucose level, determining the amount of insulin needed, and then delivering an appropriate amount of insulin. This is what our pancreas does automatically. I'm going to be talking today, as far as artificial pancreas, in three areas. Where we are now, where we're going, and how we'll get there. So first, where we are now. In order to have an artificial pancreas, you need closed loop control. Currently, people with diabetes use open loop control. So from an engineering standpoint, open loop control means you have intermittent input, you have a manual controller that you decide what to do based on the input, and there's intermittent output. <coughs> and then if you want more, more output, you can start over again with more input. Closed loop control involves continuous input, an automatic controller to modify the input, and continuous output, which feeds back on itself. So uh, a uh, closed loop control is seen in systems like thermostats and other systems which regulate themselves automatically. Now, currently doctors use intensive insulin therapy in the yellow above, which is open loop control. A person checks their blood sugar level intermittently, they use either a written or maybe electronic and a PDA in some form sliding scale which says if your blood sugar is this high you give yourself this much insulin and then they give themselves an insulin injection when it's time to make the next determination they start over again checking the blood sugar contrast that with what an artificial pancreas can do with closed loop control you have continuously monitored glucose using a, a, a computerized algorithm how much insulin is needed and therefore you can receive a continuous infusion of insulin and when you're ready to adjust the dose you, al you already have uh, an effect on the glucose level continuously so closed loop control works better it's a better goal and it's more difficult to achieve these are the three basic components of an artificial pancreas system a continuous glucose sensor an insulin delivery system and a local controller which is a type of software. It takes information about the glucose and it sends information to the insulin delivery system how much insulin is needed. And then you have a radio which can communicate between the different parts. So there's three basic components of an artificial pancreas. Glucose sensor, insulin delivery, and a controller. Uh, we need better elements of all three of these. We need better sensors, we need better insulin delivery systems. We need better control. Certainly we need better sensors. There are products on the market that are continuous glucose monitors. Uh, right now, the uh, International Standards Organization says, if you look in the yellow bar, that y the data points should be within, actually uh, I should say look within the blue bar, uh, that 95% of blood glucose data points should be within 15 milligrams if the blood sugar is low and they should be within 20% if the blood sugar is high. So if a person is using a blood glucose monitor, as long as their blood sugar is 75 or more, those data points should be within 20% for a blood glucose monitor. Now, International Standards Organization has not taken a position on how accurate the continuous glucose readings should be, but uh, I'm going to show you that this, this study done by one of the companies about how accurate they were, when they, and 95% of the data points are supposed to be within 20%. When they looked at their own product, in the low range, only 66% were within this target, 79, 79, 75 overall. So even compared to a blood glucose monitor, these aren't as accurate. So they said, let's step back. Let's see what percentage of our data points are within 30%. Now you might say, gee, if my reading is within 30%, that's not even so great. Well, can they deliver that? Well, 82, 91 overall, 86%. So even when you, say, when you t have a relatively uh, inaccurate uh, level that you're willing to live with, let's say plus or minus 30% on the reading, even that's achieved uh, seven out of eight times. So the, if you're going to give a dose of insulin, which is a powerful drug, you want to have an accurate glucose reading. 
the current continuous glucose monitors just are not quite accurate enough. They're all we have, we're using them, but it leads to some wobble in the control because the readings aren't quite accurate. I have a couple slides that'll illustrate a couple methods that are being proposed for better glucose monitors, but these are not yet FDA approved. Uh, one idea would be to use uh, mid-infrared spectroscopy, uh, but uh, put a, uh, a catheter in a vein. This could be used in the hospital, and you're measuring glucose uh, optically. Another method would be to use Raman spectroscopy to shine a, light, a laser on the skin and get a reading back according to how much glucose there is. This method we're working on at my hospital, Mills Peninsula, and it's uh, coming along pretty well. I'm hoping that this will lead to an actual product that will be a non-invasive glucose monitor. And I, I'm actually expecting that this product will be uh, on the market in Europe by the end of the year and hopefully in the U.S. Uh, in the near future. So that's continuous sensors are needed. We need better insulin delivery. Uh, the best kind of insulin delivery is, is when you eat a meal, if you can get that insulin into your system right away. Because when we eat a meal, the blood sugar level starts rising quickly. But when a person takes an insulin injection, it has to diffuse through the skin and then get into the bloodstream. And when it gets in the bloodstream, it doesn't necessarily go right to the liver where it's needed. It gets into the peripheral circulation and goes around and around, eventually gets to the liver. When our pancreas makes insulin, it, it sends it to the portal vein right to the liver. So there are these delays in the insulin getting absorbed and then the insulin taking action. So anything we can do to create better insulin or better insulin delivery means that the person can give themselves the injection when they eat and just like the blood sugar is gonna go up, they'll know that the uh, insulin level is gonna go up too. And current insulins are a little slow. So we wanna see some faster insulin when we're working with an artificial pancreas. So here's, uh, I I'm gonna show you several methods that have been proposed. This is a type of insulin from a small company in Connecticut called, the, the insulin's called Lingetta, and uh, that's in blue. They're comparing themselves with uh, sort of a standard insulin, uh, an average quality insulin that's in green. And uh, you can see that this with Lingetta, you have a peak uh, effect of insulin, peak absorption. This is called pharmacokinetics, much faster than with insulin. So this product is still being tested. We're working on this at my hospital, and it would be nice to see an insulin that gets absorbed faster than current insulins. Uh, another idea that's interesting is from a, a pharma company in San Diego that says, okay, we know that in the skin is hyaluronic acid. It forms this gel. And uh, when you give yourself an injection of insulin, let's say, the insulin sort of sits there before it diffuses. So they're using hyaluronidase, mixing it with insulin to break down the hyaluronic acid. And within a day or two, they say the uh, hyaluronic acid reforms itself but meanwhile, instead of a tight compartment for the uh, insulin, you've got basically wide open space and the insulin gets absorbed faster. So those are two approaches. Have, a, have a, a, a different kind of insulin molecule or have a way for the insulin to be absorbed faster. Um, another approach that uh, we were working with, the, uh, with uh, we're working with this product, the Halozyme product. Now another uh, method that, that we're working on in my hospital for faster delivery is called an Insu patch from a company in San Diego. Now this is actually a, a simple and a good idea. You, you, think of, you hear this and you say, yeah, I, I could have a good idea too. We know that when you heat the skin, you get better blood flow. So what these guys did is they say, okay, you've got an insulin pump and uh, the insulin is going in right here. So we'll put a little ring around where the uh, insulin goes in the body with heat on it and you heat the skin. So when a person gives themselves an injection of insulin at mealtime called a bolus, you press a button, it turns on, it heats the skin for 30 minutes and turns off. You get more blood supply there and the insulin gets pulled away faster. So they say, well, instead of creating a new molecule that's a faster absorbed insulin and it's very difficult to create new molecules, we just heat the skin. So that's a fairly simple idea and uh, it, it may turn out to be, to be working. This is like the cross section with the needle and it's supposed to see that there's heat around this area. And, uh, at, at this time, we're doing the adult studies at Mills Peninsula and at Yale, they're doing the pediatric studies. This is some data from Yale, and it shows the uh, glucose infusion rate, means basically how s uh, effectively the insulin is working. Uh, that's known as uh, pharmacodynamics. And uh, with, uh, without the INSU patch in this study, uh, you had a, a peak, uh, the, the time to the maximum concentration here was 128 minutes but with the patch it was much shorter at 90 minutes. So this is very encouraging that this INSU patch, which seems very safe, could speed up uh, insulin absorption. Uh, another approach is uh, here, 
from uh, Dr. Prousnitz at uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, he, he reports in the latest issue of uh, Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics uh, what you see from the title, Rapid Pharmacokinetics of Intradermal Insulin. And this is a very clever idea. He compared a new approach with one of his microneedles, intradermal insulin, with a standard injection, and he had much faster absorption of insulin. And uh, I was saying to Mark last night that he, he could consider working with an INSU patch, and his, insulin, his route of delivery gets in faster, and then if you, and the INSU patch people actually have a product called an INSU pad for injections. It doesn't have to be just with a pump. If you combine a microneedle and an INSU pad, which heats up the skin, perhaps you'd have some benefit, and the two effects could be additive. So I'm hoping, uh, Mark, that you and the, uh, the INSU line people will work together. I'd be very interested in what you come up with. Okay, those are all injectable methods, but one other method for faster absorption is inhaled insulin. This little device that looks like a whistle, uh, you can put some insulin powder into it and then inhale it, and uh, it turns out inhaled insulin gets absorbed faster than uh, standard injected insulin. Inhaled insulin could not be part of an artificial pancreas because you can't uh, provide automatic uh, inhalation of insulin, but all the other insulins or products I showed could be used automatically. This is what an uh, insulin pump looks like. Uh, this is, would be part of an artificial pancreas. It's, it's a box with a, with a motor that contains insulin in here, and the motor pushes a plunger that slowly pushes insulin through a syringe and then pushes it through a catheter that eventually goes into the person's body. Uh, you can program it so that you have a so-called basal dose that when you're not eating, it's giving just a little bit continuously, and then a bolus dose when you are eating, you need a big slug of insulin. You can program it and it can deliver a big slug. Or if you had an artificial pancreas, maybe it would do that for you. Current size and form factors of these pumps isn't that great. Maybe you don't want people to know that you're wearing a pump. Uh, it's, it's a bit obvious with this guy. Um, here's a, a, a product that's a little smaller. This is called an Omnipod, and uh, I said it's not, call it, don't call it a patch pump. When this came out, they did some uh, uh, patient focus groups. They said, what do you think of this device? It looks sort of like a hard-boiled egg. They said, do you like this new patch pump? They said, it's not a patch pump. It's too heavy. It doesn't look like a patch pump at all. That's ridiculous. We hate this. So they said, well, get out of here. So they brought in some new patients. They said, what do you think of our new pod pump? They said, oh, that's wonderful. It looks like a pod. We love it. So <laughs> call it a pod pump, but it's not a patch pump. So next we do have the first insulin-approved patch pump, and we helped develop this at Mills Peninsula. And this is truly a patch. You can see the profile from the side. This was started by a company from Israel, and after they got FDA approval, they were acquired by Roche. Uh, which is a big uh, device company. And I expect this will be on the market in the next year or so with the Roche label on it, but it was developed by some Israeli people at the time called uh, Medingo. Now, these are all what I call smart pumps. They can be programmed, they can do a lot of things, but I'm just going to show you one example of a dumb pump. We usually don't see dumb products, but this is a new kind of pump. I call it dumb because its capabilities are very limited. It can only give you a bolus dose at a very, uh, very fixed amount or a basal dose at a very fixed amount. So the reason they did this, they said, well, it's for people with type 2 diabetes. They don't need to adjust their insulin dosages very much. Just any kind of a basic dose will work. It's disposable after three days. So the, the, uh, um, this is a dumb pump, but uh, there could be a market for this one as well for people that don't need fine tuning. Okay, so I said we need better sensors. We need better insulin delivery. We need better control. Okay, I'm going to stop for just a moment here and uh, take just a very brief break to show you my Ferrari. This is my Ferrari. It's actually a model Ferrari. So a model is a simplified representation of a more complex system. Maybe some of you thought I had a Ferrari, but I'm an endocrinologist, so you should have known I don't. And uh, there are two widely used models of insulin release in response to glucose levels. So if somebody here is a, a control engineer, you'll probably be familiar with these two uh, types of models. One is called proportional integral derivative model. And when you're, uh, when, when you're adding uh, glucose into a system, then you want to respond by putting insulin into the system. And it uses three different measures of what's happening to the glucose. The proportional part depends on the present error. The integral depends on accumulation of past errors, and the derivative predicts future errors, 
And when you put those together, you get a particular picture. It's a little bit like the uh, 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 speedometer and the odometer and the tachometer of your car. They're each telling you something a little different. So that's a proportional integral derivative model. Another method is called model predictive control. Now this isn't specifically reacting to what it's seeing, but it uses a model which predicts the effects of the change of blood sugar and insulin on each other, and it, it, is, it defines an optimal postprandial glucose excursion. So what you have is this sort of a cycle of a feedback loop for model predictive control. Uh, you start here, and uh, you have a dose calculator for whatever your blood sugar is, and this is receiving input from the model itself helps to determine the dose, and there's feed-forward control, predicts where you want to be. It uses some individual sensitivity factors so that if I'm wearing a device, it might give me a different dose than if you're wearing a device. You have other factors that feed in, uh, what's your target level, how aggressive you want to be. If you want to be really aggressive in getting to your blood sugar quickly, then there's a risk of overshoot. And if you want to be really slow and gentle, then you may not get to where you want to go. So you have to program this in. Uh, safety schemes, what do you do about an outlier? Um, you know, the, out the uh, effect of outlier is really uh, important in the glucose monitoring field. Um, just to give you an example, let's say you have a, well, I, I won't go into this too far, but if there's a data point that's really far off, you have to decide, is that just something we should ignore, or is that really a, a valid number? And you have to program in what you do about it. And uh, various other factors, and eventually you get to a blood glucose level. Uh, th what I would say, a more simplified way of comparing proportional integral control with model predictive control is, uh, if you look at this map of San Francisco here, uh, PID is like a map. It reacts to what changes there are to get you back on target. So if you're driving, you get lost, you pull out your map, and you realize, oh, I went down the wrong street, you, go, you make a U-turn, you go back, and you get started again. Model predictive control is like a GPS system. This will get you on the correct path to your target, but it may be a totally different route than you came in on. And uh, it just gets you to where you want to go. So in terms of engineering, they're supposed to lead to the same results, which is the target blood sugar, but they get there in different ways. Um, when you have an artificial pancreas, you have a target, you have various trade-offs. So this is one of the most important trade-offs, I would say. It's the trade-off of sensitivity versus specificity for mealtime insulin delivery. So you want the blood sugar, you want the insulin to be uh, uh, released when a person eats, but you don't want it to be released when the blood sugar goes up for some other reason. So the first bullet says the artificial pancreas can be set to respond rapidly to a rise in blood sugar so you don't chase postprandial blood sugar levels. So as soon as the blood sugar starts rising, boom, that must be a meal you put in the insulin. That means sensitivity is primary. So if you think there might be a meal, then you give the insulin dose. But what happens here in orange is that this device will respond inappropriately to a noise or to some random change in blood sugar with excessive insulin. So because you weren't specific and you, you would just put in insulin with any little rise in blood sugar, sometimes you'll be giving too much insulin. You'll be delivering inappropriately. That's when you make sensitivity your primary method. You say, okay, well, I don't want to give inappropriate insulin. So let's make specificity primary. So then you go down to the second bullet. It says the artificial pancreas can be set to respond only to a frank elevation in the mean blood sugar. It's got to really go up quite a bit before we determine that this is a meal. So we're not giving insulin when it's not needed. We're going to be very specific. That's our primary goal. Well, when you do that, and you get into the last three lines of orange, the response now will be delayed because you want to make sure that the blood sugar has risen high enough following the meal. And then because you're giving the insulin a little it's late, has to be late, you're going to have a difficult time controlling the blood sugar. So basically that's a fancy way of saying you can't win. If you give the insulin at the first sign of a rise in blood sugar, you'll be giving it when you didn't need it sometimes. And if you're cautious and you pull back and you wait, then you'll be giving it too late at other times. Now, how do you get around that? Well, it helps if you have a good sensor, it helps if you have good insulin delivery, and it helps if you have intelligent uh, control. So that's what we need. Now another element of control is what I call the one direction control problem. So how can a car maintain its velocity within a safe range if the car has only an accelerator but no brakes? And you certainly wouldn't want that kind of car rumbling down California Street in San Francisco. Well, if it's an artificial pancreas and, uh, and you're moving toward, let's say, low blood sugar because you gave a big dose of insulin, what's to protect you and put the brakes on? Well, Nothing. 
But some people would say, maybe we need a bi-hormonal system. We have insulin to lower the blood sugar if it's too high. Why not have something else like perhaps glucagon to raise the blood sugar if it's too low? And uh, we've really been promoting this idea at our uh, organization, Diabetes Technology Society. It's catching on. This is an article that came out from a group at Boston University and Harvard last year in Science Translational Medicine. So they're giving people not only insulin, but they have two pumps, insulin and glucagon. I think this is really a good idea, but it makes it more complicated. Now I'm going to show you uh, some examples of products where we have now. Uh, it, it, there is a continuous glucose monitor that's linked with an insulin pump, but it doesn't, it doesn't have any software. You see the information, but you, you still have to act upon it. Now this, this device is called the Guardian Real Time, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's an insulin pump, but it's also got this little uh, sort of ball on the left. I'm going to show you what this is. The insulin pump here, a typical insulin pump just shows you what the, how much insulin you give yourself. This has some extra information. First, it has real-time alarms. This little circle will turn black if the blood sugar is out of a specified range. It has real-time graphics. You're reading all the glucose information on your pump. You can, you can press a button and you look at your insulin dose, or you can look at your glucose levels. Because what's happening here is you stick this glucose sensor in the skin, there's a little needle at the tip of it, and uh, it's, it uses the same kind of reaction as a blood glucose monitor. And inside this ball, this is a wireless transmitter. You're holding this, this, you're wearing this because it's a pump, and it's a continuous glucose monitor. It's a monitor. It tells you what you're seeing at the same time. So you're wearing this, and you're reading your blood sugar off the screen here. So you see the alarm, you see the graphics. You can set this, in this case it's set for 24 hours, but you can make it for one hour, or three hours, or six hours. You can always see how you're doing. Uh, these are trend arrows. Uh, since these devices are not as accurate as we'd like them to be, wh what makes up for that to some extent is trend arrows. If your blood sugar, let's say, is 60, which is close to hypoglycemia, and it's rising, well, you, you're, maybe you're okay. But if it's 60 and it's falling, then, then you know it's going to get really low fast unless you eat something. So the trend arrows do give you some important information, how your blood sugar is going from one data point to the next. So you have the trend arrows, the real-time reading, in this case the blood sugar is 128. So this is the kind of information that's projected from the glucose sensor onto the insulin pump with this product, which is from uh, Medtronic. Now, we do have HIPAA laws. As mo most of you are not medical, but uh, if you are, you know that we're not supposed to reveal who our patients are or who are research subjects. But since this is not a hospital, I'm going to do something and reveal someone. But I have to ask you not to tell on me. I'm going to show you who the first subject was to receive an implantable closed loop system. And uh, without permission, Moon. Moon was the first subject. And uh, what they did with Moon and Medtronic was pancreatectomize Moon. And uh, of course, Moon's blood sugar was terrible. And then they put him on a closed loop system. It got pretty good, then took him off again. So now you've seen the first patient to receive an artificial pancreas system. But it's, now it's even used in humans. No more pictures of uh, subjects. Uh, this is an article that came out last year in Lancet from a group at uh, uh, Cambridge that's doing really good work. And this is a manual closed loop system. Remember, we want automatic. This was manual, but it was as recent as last year. This is as good as they could get it overnight. I mean, we'd like 24 hours a day. They're doing eight hours a day or 12 hours a day. It's manual. But what happened is there'd be a nurse, and every 15 minutes, the blood sugar would be checked, and uh, she would have to approve a dose that was uh, recommended by the controller. But she could override it if she wished to. It turned out she didn't. but. When a person goes home, they're not going to have a nurse with them, you know, giving them advice every 15 minutes. So this is just a, a start, but it does show that they had good readings and they were, um, they were all essentially all within their, their own specified target of 70 to 140. Okay, so that was uh, Havorka's group last year. Now this year, they're, they're doing pretty well. Now they've got an automatic closed loop overnight system. So they've made progress. This one does automatic. Now the control isn't quite as good because uh, once in a while, um, it, you know, we, the control, the algorithm wasn't quite as good as it needed, but 60% of the data points were within the target range, which is this pink zone. So, and, and I'll tell you, people who use insulin 
and are not on an artificial pancreas don't do much better than this. So this is starting to look good, but again, this is in a hospital and uh, with close supervision. But you know, we're, we're making some progress. Okay, where are we going? Now, I showed you what the basic components of an artificial pancreas are, but we're going to see these systems become more complex. For example, pretty soon they're going to automatically have a glucagon delivery system, We'll have some method for daily insulin sensitivity. Some days you need more insulin than other days. And there'll be a remote controller in some way so that maybe even your doctor or your nurse, if you're wearing one, can uh, override this. So those are the emerging systems. Is that all we're going to see? No, we're going to see even more. Eventually, we're going to see integration of electronic medical record data so that we can see what's the context of these blood sugar levels. Telemedicine management, because we'll have wireless communication. Uh, We'll have sensors for exercise and food that will improve the control algorithm. And I think we're going to see emergency service and GPS. Um, there, these are some inputs that, uh, uh, these are glucose inputs into an artificial pancreas. So even when I say we need a glucose sensor, that glucose sensor is not just telling you what's your blood sugar. It tells you a lot of other types of information about the glucose level. But as the last slide indicates, glucose is not the only input. This slide, and I'm not going to read this because there's too many, but there's like 12 kinds, at least, at least 12 kinds of inputs that can be used in algorithms, and mathematicians are currently sort of adding one at a time to see what, what they can do. But, you know, our bodies are so complicated, it just almost seems ludicrous that if here's the blood sugar, this is what the pancreas could do. There's so many other features that feed into this sort of decision that the pancreas would make. Uh, so now, how we're going to get there? Well. There's an area that I'm particularly interested in, which is telemedicine. The future artificial pancreas will provide telemedicine care. So I'm going to show you two products that are pretty expensive. These are complicated computerized systems which could cost thousands of dollars to lease or buy. An artificial pancreas or a Cadillac. Now, if you buy a Cadillac, very likely you're going to want to by OnStar, because OnStar is the in-vehicle safety and security system created to help protect you on the road while you tool around in your expensive Cadillac. So what do you get with OnStar? Well, they have automatic crash response. In a crash, built-in sensors automatically alert OnStar. An advisor immediately calls to see if you're okay. Even if you can't respond, they'll send help to your exact location using GPS, and OnStar relays critical crash details such as severity and point of impact to emergency responders. Now that's pretty nice if you have a Cadillac. What if you have an artificial pancreas? Maybe something like that would be nice. I would call that, say that a closed loop pancreas will require a system which can diagnose and fix problems remotely, just like OnStar. And it's what I call the knowledge of loop operations necessary system to accomplish repairs. OnStar. This is the automatic artificial pancreas response. In hypoglycemia, built-in sensors automatically alert Clonstar. An advisor immediately calls to see if you're okay. Even if you can't respond, they'll send help using GPS. Clonstar relays critical diabetes information such as glucose levels and insulin infusion rates <coughs> to emergency responders. And, uh, a group at UC Santa Barbara has already written a paper about how they could build a CONSTAR uh, from the bioengineering department there. So that's what we're going to see. This is a complicated device, and, and you're not out there alone. Your doctor or nurse will have a way to help you. Now, uh, there have been some recent developments in artificial pancreas research within the last few months. Uh, uh, just to show, this is our journal a uh, year and a half ago. We published a symposium on artificial pancreas systems. We'll be publishing another symposium later this year. Our journal publishes the most articles about artificial pancreas of any journal in the world, as well as other types of technology. Uh, juvenile Diabetes held a panel. They asked some people who are interested in artificial pancreas to make some recommendations about what should be the features of a protocol. They happened to invite me to be on the panel, and the uh, FDA uh, juvenile put out a uh, uh, a press release November 10th that they've got these recommendations that they're going to submit to FDA. Um, on November 10th, FDA put on a public workshop along with NIH. It was an artificial pancreas workshop to discuss what are, should be the features of artificial pancreas research. So there's interest in that circle as well. 
uh, in February of this year, uh, NIH put out their 10-year plan. Uh, I, I was one of the advisors of that plan, which is uh, Opportunities in Diabetes Research, and we had a session, a, there's a section in that book on uh, bioengineering research and artificial pancreas. So, although NIH is, is, is woefully underfunding the, uh, the, the, this area, they do recognize that it's important as based that it's part of their 10-year plan. And uh, the FDA is expected to publish a guidance for the artificial pancreas products before the end of 2011 based on their November meeting. And this is an aerial photo of FDA. You may have heard of the FDA being in Rockville, Maryland, but uh, they're now moving to Silver Spring, Maryland. They've got a new facility, which is, a, this is the facility in Silver Spring. Now this is a, uh, there are a couple slides here I want to show that I'm very excited about. This is going to be the first artificial pancreas product. And the analogy I use is if we want to get to the moon and, and we're earthbound, this would be like the Wright brothers. This is going to be the Wright brothers of artificial pancreas. It's called the Minimed Paradigm VO system. It's not FDA approved in the U.S. It is approved in Europe. This system is, has a threshold low glucose suspend feature. What that means is that you have a continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump. Uh, the, the monitor makes an alarm if your blood sugar is low, if you're hypoglycemic. But unfortunately, people sometimes sleep through the alarm, so it's not enough to wake them up and say, hey, turn down your insulin or better eat something. So this device, if, if you get hypoglycemic and you don't change your insulin dose or do anything, it will suspend the insulin for two hours. So here, just as you've got too much insulin, your blood sugar is going down, down, maybe in the range where you could have a stroke or heart attack, it shuts off the insulin and gives your body a chance for that glucose level to start coming up again. So that could avoid a very serious uh, event. And uh, uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a sensor augmented pump similar to the Guardian real time that I showed earlier. This is what it looks like to wear a VO. You've got an insulin pump, and, uh, which we've seen some pumps. You have, a, and here it delivers the insulin, you have one of these continuous glucose monitors like what we've seen before. It sends the information into the, into the pump. So it looks just like a, a sensor augmented pump, but it has the low glucose suspend uh, uh, feature. And uh, we're hoping to, be, uh, to do some studies with VL later this year if, uh, if uh, the company and the FDA can reach agreement on what the protocol will look like. And then I'll be the national principal investigator on this study. So, I've shown you some ideas, though, that many people have for artificial pancreas. I actually have an idea, my own proposal for an artificial pancreas. Uh, I tried to raise some venture capital funding, but uh, so far it hasn't quite caught on. But my idea is a high-tech talking artificial pancreas. Uh, what do you think? My conclusions are that artificial pancreas devices will contain implanted hardware with wireless support. The first artificial pancreas in the U.S. will be a sensor augmented pump with low glucose suspend feature. We need more data about the safety, the efficacy, and the economic impact of these systems, especially to get payment from insurance companies. But the artificial pancreas will revolutionize diabetes care. My goal for artificial pancreas is to have normal levels of, thank you very much. That's my license plate. Thank you, David. So we have time for a few questions. So it, it strikes me that one of the, the, the problems in having good tight regulation is the time lag between receiving information and having that insulin in the bloodstream. So if by some method, you could have the, the insulin infusion ID and, and, and immediate. Would that reduce the need for sophisticated controllers? Yes, if you could use IV insulin, that would reduce the need. That, and and uh, that approach is actually used uh, for some hospitalized patients. There's a device that I worked with when I was a fellow called a biostatter uh, that, that's like a closed loop IV uh, uh, system. Uh, the company stopped manufacturing it, and uh, so there are a few people that still work with those. Uh, you can use it for sub-Q or for IV, but it's really good for IV when you're doing an operation on an insulin-producing tumor. Um, I'll tell you how that works. 
uh, so there, there's a type of tumor called an insulinoma. It makes too much insulin, and you have low blood sugar. And it's, I mean, people go around, they're passing out from low blood sugar. They've got to eat to protect themselves. They get fat. They're passing out. It's really a terrible thing. So they go in for surgery, and the, uh, the, the surgeon's going to remove the, the part of the pancreas that contains the tumor. The pancreas is like a, sort of like a, say it looks sort of like a banana, and he'll slice off the last part of it that contains the tumor. He can't scoop it out. He's just got to sacrifice a certain amount of pancreas that contains that tumor. So often they're so small he can't see it. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll, maybe they'll take a slice, but it's the wrong slice. They should have been more aggressive. But if he takes off the whole pancreas, it's really hard on a person afterward. It just wrecks their life. So how can he find this basically invisible tumor? What they do is they put somebody on a biostatter, and it's delivering uh, glucose to maintain the blood sugar level. And he does a slice, and it's still doing the same amount of glucose. Now, it does another slice, and the amount of glucose that needs to be delivered drops greatly. What that means is when he took the second slice off, now there's no more insulin being dumped into the system. You don't need so much glucose. So you're following the glucose delivery. When it drops off, you know, now you've taken the, enough pancreas to get rid of the tumor. Uh, the, the, the problem I would see with an IV system, though, is uh, the IVs are, are uh, in the long run, they're dangerous for people to have something in their vein. So it works for a few days while they're in the hospital, but it's not, a, it's not an outpatient solution. So, so I have a follow-up question to this, because I was thinking about this problem as well. So is it, is it really a problem of point of sensing and point of infusion for the artificial pancreas versus the natural pancreas? Or is it that the natural uh, uh, pancreas, the, the, the actual physiology of humans and animals, have additional sensing mechanisms and control mechanisms, like feed forward, for example. Well, it, it, everything you said is correct. Uh, we, we have to go beyond just the blood sugar level. There, there are other types of input that would affect uh, insulin release. Uh, just, just for example, uh, you know, we talk about Pavlov's dogs. Uh, we know that when people see food, they start making insulin even before the food gets into the body. So there's something that comes from our eyes to the brain, to the vagus nerve, to the pancreas. That's, that's, that, we can't even match that. But the, the, the uh, control people are trying to identify every factor which affects uh, insulin release and put that into their control algorithm. Yeah, that would be a challenge, like you say, because uh, certain foods are going to raise the blood sugar faster than others. Therefore, ideally, you would deliver the insulin to have its peak action the same time as the food. So, yeah, that is a factor. One thing that you have going for you, but I mean, that, that factor will not go away. It should be incorporated. They'll try to uh, simplify it in some way. Maybe they'll say it's a high or low glycemic index meal and shift the insulin delivery to some extent. One thing that, that at least the system has working in its favor is the, the concept of glycemic index works really well for an individual food, but it seems like when you mix foods together, it, it washes out to some extent, and you can be eating a food that seems very healthy from glycemic index, but one that's unhealthy, and in the end they all just sort of muddle together and give you sort of an average glycemic index. So uh, when, when I read about glycemic index, it's almost always this food and this glycemic index, which refers to how long it takes for the glucose level to reach its peak. But when you mix them together, it, it's less of an of a important factor. I mean, even with like, our current pancreas, when you eat high glycemic foods, the pancreas overcompensates for that, and you end up with a glycemic value. Um, and that's what causes the vicious sugar cycles that face. Well, that's true. What, what, what you're saying is absolutely true, that when you eat food very high in simple sugar, and the, the reason this happens is the pancreas is responding not only to the absolute blood sugar, but to the rise in blood sugar. 
and uh, these, these sweet foods are just rising really fast. When I showed that slide of proportional integral derivative, you may remember there's like a red, and that, that's reflect, reflecting the second derivative of the rise in glucose. And when it rises quickly, you get this big spike at the beginning. It's that spike which leads to the overcorrection that you're talking about. And uh, uh, all I can say is that people with diabetes are told, and they should be reminded, don't eat a lot of sweets, and this would be a good reason why. I mean, if somebody persists in eating sweets, then the artificial pancreas won't control them well. Are there other metabolites in the blood that um, would, uh, how do you say, warn, uh, could be used to warn an algorithm that, um, say, glycogen is being released or other um, events like we were talking about? Not, not to release it, you mentioned before, releasing more insulin. Mm -hmm. But instead, just maybe a, a, a hormone, in, a stress hormone, a cortisol level, something like that, that would kind of uh, change the balance. I, I think that we would see what you're saying on two levels. One is, uh, for an individual, the uh, sensitivity to insulin can vary from day to day and that may be related to stress hormones. Even, you, you might think you've got your artificial pancreas and you've got a great algorithm, now you can go with it. But it changes from day to day and it definitely changes from person to person so that we'll have a, f a control algorithm but it might be if we were both wearing one of these devices that they would tune yours one way and they would tune mine a different way. And I mean, when you get down to it, it's gotta be because of substances that are circulating or neurologic in our system. They're just not that well understood, but you know, people are looking at them one by one. The, the, the ones that we seem to understand the best are the four stress hormones that raise blood sugar, the so-called counter-regulatory hormones. So that's glucagon, growth hormone, uh, cortisol, and epinephrine. And those are, we're just starting to program those into the system. Beyond that, uh, I don't know exactly what else they're gonna look at. But they, I, they may need more than that, but that's the four that so they're going to look at. for those items. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I, I agree with you. It's, it's hard enough, uh, right now, you know, it's hard enough to have a good glucose sensor. Uh, the glucose sensors work through electrochemistry, which is a, an enzyme breaking down glucose. And uh, <clears throat> you get an electron liberated, and that's current, and then the current is proportional to glucose. These other molecules, don't necessarily lend themselves to the same electrochemistry. So it would require a, a, probably a totally different type of sensor. And uh, we're just not there yet. Ma the military is always interested in funding new sensors to monitor soldiers. So we may hear that they're going to get interested in, in one of these other substances. Uh, but right now, we just don't, need, we don't have sensors at all for those four. We need them, but we don't have them. That's a good question. I didn't, I didn't say. But it's actually the real fast active one, so known as analog insulin. It's, uh, it could, the brands would be Humalog or Novolog or uh, 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 Epidra. But these, these insulins, if you were to use an injection, get like a little puddle of insulin, get in the bloodstream the fastest. So they're all now, in the last year or so, they've all become FDA approved to put an insulin pump. So even when you drip it in a drop at a time, that little drop will probably get in a little faster than a drop of other insulin. Well, for preserving insulin, first of all, the insulin is supposed to be kept at roughly room temperature, not too hot. It'll be great if it's too hot. So it's like you're carrying a bottle of insulin around with you. You can't go someplace where it's really hot. Uh, next thing is once you open a bottle of insulin, you're not supposed to use it after 30 days. Uh, it, it, you, you get some uh, fibrillation. Uh, these insulin pumps we use now generally hold about three or four days worth of insulin. Uh, but when you go back to regular bottle, you should throw it out if it's been more than 30 days. But uh, that generally would only happen to somebody who's using, let's say, 30 units a day or less, because the bottle has 1,000 units, so 30 days, roughly 30 units a day. And that, that's in the ballpark of what a person with 
diabetes uses, but if they're using less than that, maybe 28 units or 25 units, they could maybe be at the end of the month and they haven't used their bottle up, but they still should throw it out. I think if they do those things, the temperature, throw it out after 30 days, they'll be in pretty good shape. The glucose sensor is in the interstitial fluid. It's in the skin. It's not measuring blood, but it's measuring a fluid that sort of passes out of blood vessels and is in, uh, in our skin. But a lot of studies have shown that the fluid has just about the same concentration as what's in the blood. They're in a steady state, so it flows from the blood to the interstitial fluid. So if you know the glucose concentration in the interstitial fluid, essentially you know what's in the blood. And through long experience with insulin, we know that a certain amount of insulin will lower the blood sugar to a certain extent, or conversely, if you're going to eat certain meals, a certain dose of insulin will prevent a rise above a certain extent. So um, I, I guess I'd just say it's through experience using insulin. We know what insulin, wh how strong insulin is, so when you're writing a control algorithm, you just sort of start with that. Like In terms of, you might say, one unit of insulin will lower the blood sugar by, say, 30 milligrams per deciliter, and then you can just fine tune it from there. Well, those are good questions. It sounds like you're interested in a non-invasive glucose monitor, no needle. Uh, the, the, uh, I showed a slide of a, of a, a journal article in our journal with red trim of the Raman spectroscopy device. This is a non-invasive monitor, no needles. It's taped to the skin. It looks a little bit like a, uh, maybe like one of these microphones or sort of like this. They tape it onto the skin. It has laser. It shines on the skin. And uh, that if the, if the upcoming studies show that it's truly accurate, it's got to be, I mean, they, they still have to prove it, but if it's truly accurate, then a device like that could replace a subcutaneous sensor. Yes. Um, some of the other fluids we've looked at uh, don't, don't track that quickly. For example, you could look at sugar in the urine. That gives you some idea, but it sort of integrates how your blood sugar has been over uh, quite a period of time. Plus, it even has a threshold that it doesn't even appear unless your blood sugar is at a certain point. Sweat, there's no threshold, but it tracks slowly and sort of poorly. Tears maybe tracks slowly. I mean, it's one thing if you say, I'm, at, I, I'm not eating, I, I'm fasting, and I'm at a certain level for a long time, you can get a, a reading that could be proportioned to blood. But, you know, people eat, they exercise, do things, so you need something that will go up and down fairly quickly the way blood sugar goes up. We don't know of anything yet that that's as good as blood, except interstitial fluid. And as far as uh, impedance, uh, you're mentioning an idea that I think is a really good idea, which is that we need a good hypoglycemia detector. Now, the blood sugar that we measure, since it's not that accurate, you know, I showed you 30% uh, error, even that isn't 100% of the time. You can't even count on being within 30%. Uh, but the body goes through certain changes when we're hypoglycemic. So they relate to uh, the uh, autonomic nervous system. So maybe there could be a way of measuring an active autonomic nervous system, a change in the EKG, a change in the EEG a change in sweating, change in trembling, something that, that, that's a, a response to hypoglycemia. So if that fires, you're saying this is, this is a qualitative measure of hypoglycemia. We have an alarm going off. We don't know what the blood sugar is. It could be 51, it could be 21, we don't know. But we do know that this person is reacting to not having enough sugar. And, you know, in control theory, one of the ideas is that you like to have different ways of measuring the same thing. So if one of your systems is contaminated for some reason, even if you have two sensors next to each other, if there's something uh, systemic, 
they could both be fooled. But if you have two different ways of making the measurement that are different from each other, that's really good. So a project that's very much needed uh, for one of you engineers here would be to develop a qualitative hypoglycemia detector. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, it, it's, it's unusual, but it does happen with skin problems. Once in a while, with all these devices, you have to try different brands of tape. Uh, they do work with exercise, even when people are sweating. I mean, unless they're sweating massively. Uh, what, what we hear from device companies, I'm going to tell you something. I've heard this sentence about 50 times. A person from a company has a new device that goes on the skin and uh, maybe it's measuring sugar, or it's giving insulin to something, and you say to them, well, how are you going to get this to stick so it, this, the tape doesn't bother the person? And they always say, we're going to call 3M. So <laughs> that's what I'll say. <laughs> okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, let's thank our speaker again.